speaking to our distinguished speakers, chairs, and audiences in different parts of the world. This is the second session in our anniversary edition of ACNS webinars, in which we have two great speakers ahead who are going to enlighten us through their lectures. The first speaker for today is a very well-known giant in the field of cerebrovascular surgery and skull base, and it is my great honor and privilege to introduce you to Professor Jacques Morkos. Before I start his introduction, let me first congratulate him on behalf of the ACNS for being named the Vice President-Elect of the American Association of Neurosurgeons. Professor Morkos is a professor and co-chairman, Department of Neurological Surgery, Professor of Clinical Neurosurgery and Otolaryngeology, Director of Cerebrovascular Surgery and Skull Base Surgery, University of Miami. He is also the Division Chief Cranial Neurosurgery at the Jackson Memorial Hospital. His range of clinical and research expertise includes all skull base and complex brain tumors, endoscopic skull base surgery, and all aspects of cerebrovascular surgery, including AVMs, cavernoma, bypass surgery for complex aneurysms, moya moya, and ischemic disease. Professor Morcos is active in neurosurgical academia nationally and internationally. His academic teachings has been extended globally to the young neurosurgeons of the world during this pandemic in the form of the monthly webinars run by him, which are titled the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposia and the University of Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Base International Symposia. He is the past chair, past president of the ANS-CNS section on cerebrovascular surgery, the North American Skull Base Society, the Society of University of Neurosurgeons, and the World Association of Lebanese Neurosurgeons. Dr. Marcos serves on several editorial boards, including Journal of Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery, World Neurosurgery, and Journal of Neurological Surgery, Part B, Skull Base, and others. He holds numerous awards and distinctions. His academic and scholarly activities include 702 invited national and international presentations, 194 presentations at practical course symposia, 150 peer-reviewed article chapters and other publications, and 84 visiting professorship and guest lectureships. We are extremely honored and thankful to Professor Morcos for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today is going to talk about the topic title Intraoperative Blood Flow Assessment During Bypass Surgery. Second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Navy. Professor V is a consulting neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. He was a pre previous fellow at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Michigan University. He researches his specialty in cerebrovascular field and has several publications in various peer reviewed journals in this regard. We are extremely thankful to Professor Navy for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today is going to talk about surgical strategies for carotid atherosclerosis. The chair for the first session of today is one of the most famous faces of Japanese neurosurgery, also known as the super bypass surgeon, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. Professor Tanikawa is the executive vice president and director of Department of Neurosurgery Stroke Center, Sapporo Teshinkai Hospital, Sapporo, Japan. Professor Tanikawa is an accomplished surgeon who is also committed for the training of the young neurosurgeons. He conducts one of the most famous neurosurgery courses, which is the Paris Neurosurgery Training, which, which are run annually at Sapporo. He has been rewarded with many awards and honors for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery. He has also published several articles in various acclaimed neurosurgery journals. We sincerely thank him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of Professor Morcos. The chair of the second session of today's Associate Professor Yoshida Kasumichi. Dr. Kasumichi is the Associate Professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Kyoto University Graduate School of Medicine, Japan. He is a prominent member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and Japan Stroke Society. He has been rewarded with Academic Encouragement Award three times from the Japanese Society of Neurosurgery. He reserves his expertise in surgery for stroke and carotid endarterchemy and, and endovascular neurosurgery. We are extremely grateful to Professor Kazumichi for accepting our invitation to chair today's second session of webinar. A very warm welcome to all the distinguished faculties, especially Professor Shubin from Huashan Hospital, who is one of the main mentors and supporter of the ACNS webinar for us in China. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, we sincerely welcome both the speakers and chairs and all the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to Professor Tanikawa. Thank you for your introduction, Raja. Uh, tonight, uh, tonight in, in Asia and uh, this morning in the US, uh, we have an excellent lecture uh, from by uh, Professor Jack Morcos from Miami University. Uh, he, Professor Jack Morcos is a uh, uh, one of the best neurosurgeon in the world and uh, uh, one of the most renowned neurosurgeon in the world. Actually, uh, we have uh, we have been a friend in neurosurgery since uh, in two thousand five or four. 
I, I'm not sure, but the, the around the, the uh, 16, 17 years, uh, we have we have been we have been uh, known each other, and uh, uh, my my first seeing my first seeing you it's uh, it was in West Palm Beach by Professor Fukushima's cat about dissection course. Yes, Do you he, he produced, absolutely in long yeah. key long boat key in West. Uh, actually in yeah. Florida. And he said, I want to introduce you to one of the best bypass surgeons in the world. And that's what <laughs> how he introduced you to me. Hey, thank you. Anyway, uh, the ja Jack is uh, everybody knows and uh, he has an enormous experience, not only uh, uh, bypass uh, cerebral vascular surgery, but also uh, uh, skull based surgery and uh, many uh, knowledge about the uh, neurosurgery. Especially he's a, a, a very good knowledge about the, uh, the indications of neurosurgery and uh, how to think of the uh, uh, neurosurgery. And uh, the, as well, the, the, the he has a the excellent skill. So the, uh, I'm a very, uh, looking forward to uh, hear your uh, excellent lecture to, tonight, this morning. Thank you very much. Please begin your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Rokua. Thank you all. Thank you to the ACNS for uh, um, inviting me. Well, um, this is a tremendous honor and a pleasure mostly to be with friends. I'm, I'm delighted. It's a pleasant surprise. Shu Bin is, uh, on, uh, is here also, a wonderful friend. Uh, so um, uh, I am going to talk to you about what I have learned from intraoperative blood flow measurements during bypass surgery for Moya Moya and steno occlusive disease. Now, please realize my experience, relatively speaking, even though it's, you know, one of the probably uh, largest in the US doesn't come close in volume to what uh, Shu Bin's experience, of course, or, or, or perhaps Rokua or others in Asia, but uh, it's okay, we can still learn from smaller series than in the thousands. So, uh, so here is what uh, I'd like to talk about. The, my disclosures are completely irrelevant to this talk. Um, this uh, this uh, paper is uh, has been submitted, and that's what the bulk of my presentation will be. And the co-authors you see listed down there are uh, our residents, some of our residents. My fellow is the first author, an excellent cerebrovascular fellow, Dr. Nick Khan, who helped me analyze my data, and several of our stroke neurologists with whom we work very closely, of course, at our center. Um, so I wanted to analyze my Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome, and steno occlusive disease experience, validate the use of direct bypass, and evaluate particularly the predictive power of intraoperative flow measurements that I routinely perform, and look at long-term bypass patency clinical and angiographic outcomes. I've looked at about 20 years. Uh, I was the only surgeon for this series. Of course, I've excluded bypass for aneurysms and tumors. I do not use indirect bypasses. I, uh, I perform, as you will see, more than 99% of the time, direct bypasses, direct anastomosis. And I have utilized three types of anastomosis. I am calling them 1D1R, meaning one donor, one recipient, meaning one anastomosis, one donor, two recipients, 1D2R, meaning two anastomosis from one branch, or two donor, two recipients. So double anastomosis, double donors. Uh, <coughs> I try to keep it simple. It's usually usually a straight incision. The bone flap is six centimeter, um, is centered six centimeter above the ear canal, so we can get to the distal sylvian fissure. And let's start with a typical case, 32-year-old female. She is actually a, a nurse in a stroke unit, 
and she has typical Moya Moya. She presented with an infarct. Here is her Moya Moya, 75% stenosis of M1, 34% stenosis of A1. Um, here is her attempt at collateral formation from the uh, posterolateral choroidal and, and uh, to the anterior choroidal and from PCA to ACA and MCA. A very typical Moya Moya. Please also to the young trainees in the audience, don't be, be, don't be discouraged when you see a relatively small STA on an angiogram. It's not always small. It may look small until you dissect it and it becomes large. Every bypass patient that I consider doing bypass on, I obtain, besides the angiogram, the history, I obtain two other pieces of information. Uh, I like physiologic measurements, so we like to do VMR, vasomotor reactivity, using transcranial Doppler. It's a very simple formula that has to do with hypercapnia and hypocapnia, and a normal value is close to 70%, and you can see in her case, the right hemisphere 27, the left hemisphere 32%. I used to do SPECT with Diamox. Nowadays, we use CT perfusion and MR perfusion, but this is typical uh, steel phenomenon. Now, that's typical setup of an STA bypass. Uh, we dissect uh, the uh, parietal branch, and here in this case, also the anterior branch, a small, relatively small bone flap. We identify the recipient arteries, and then this is a flow meter, and I measure, I make baseline measurements. In this case, the recipient artery is 3.1 cc per minute. Uh, the, I cut the STA and measure the flow in it. In this case, it was 60 cc per minute. This is following the idea and concept of my good friend, Fadi Sherbel from UIC. Um, I, you know, uh, sometimes I do interrupted, sometimes I do continuous suturing, depending how small the artery is. Uh, if it is 0.5 millimeter uh, or less, which is rare, uh, uh, I would do interrupted usually. And uh, there is, I measure the donor caliber. Then when I'm finished, I measure the total bypass flow. In this case, it was 64 cc per minute. Then you can measure how does it bifurcate. One goes proximally, one goes distally. In this case, distally was 23 cc's and the remaining 41 cc went the other way. So I've collected all this data on, on, on all the patients and then you divide again from Charbel a concept of CFI, cut flow index. You divide the bypass flow by the cut flow. And the idea is you want it to be as close to 100% or more as possible, indicating that the patient really needed the bypass and that your technique was good, that there was no error in technique. It, the problem could be one of those two things, of course. So here is the final numbers uh, after we obtained that. Here is a post-op CTA showing a patent bypass. And then I brought her a few weeks later and I did her other side. This is after doing her other side, bilateral STMCA bypasses. How about atherosclerotic disease? I am not going to discuss the COS study. Uh, it will take too much of this lecture time. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, a paper we have written, the joint section of cerebrovascular surgery, uh, when uh, the paper, when the COS results came out, critiqued, critiquing some aspects of the COS, but uh, that's a long conversation. My summary of where we stand today, where I stand today with my stroke neurologist is that bypass surgery for cerebral ischemia is absolutely necessary in select cases. The key is which are, who are those patients? So this is such an example. This man was 76 years old at the time. You might say, oh, this is too old to consider. Absolutely not. Look at his watershed ischemia in the right hemisphere. This man was having daily 
multiple TIAs. He had a carotid occlusion in the neck. He had poor collaterals from the left side uh, and very little collaterals from the posterior circulation via the PCOM and PL to PL. And his SPECT scan with and without Diamox demonstrated a, a paradoxical misery perfusion. And so this man is a perfect candidate for a bypass in spite of what Koss said. And I remind you, Koss showed that if you don't have a complication with these surgeries, the PET scan, the uh, PET 015, improves in patients uh, the, uh, that uh, have a successful bypass. The problem with the COS was a morbidity, mor surgical morbidity mortality of 15%, which is why it did not uh, work and uh, it was negative for bypass. This man's VMR was 19%, extremely low. He had essentially no reserve. His other hemisphere was 55%. So I did a bypass, a single 1D, 1R in this case, one donor, one recipient, end to side. And this is CTA post-op. This man died 10 years later without a single TIA after the surgery, he died of a heart attack at, at age 86. I followed him several years. Um, so this is just a typical example of why bypass surgery should remain alive and well. Of course, for Moya Moya, which is well known, but also for atherosclerotic ischemia. So how have I looked at my series of uh, 162 uh, consecutive cases? I looked at severity of disease, suitability of donor, how much collateralization they had specifically, whether the collateralization was compensated or not. And I will show you uh, what I mean. So these are the three ways you can collateralize. You can have top left transdural collaterals. You can have leptomeningeal collaterals or ret from the PC, uh, posterior circulation or retrograde flows via the PCOM, or you can have cross flow from the anterior, from the ACOM. So then we overlapped the different injections on a given patient and decided if there remained an area of hypoperfusion that was not compensated angiographically. This is just, of course, a visual. So then we categorized all this on every patient uh, uh, that we could obtain angiograms on since the series went back uh, 20 years. Same thing here, you overlap the angiograms and you see if in this case there was compensation. We looked at bypass patency, we looked at Matsushima grading, A, B and C post-op. So this is a typical mature bypass that lasted many years. You can see how large the STA caliber is. You can see, I don't know if you see my pointer, but I did not utilize the anterior branch of the STA. You can see how small it is with respect to the parietal branch, which was used for the bypass. It's a nice uh, uh, example of uh, adaptation. This is another typical mature bypass. 11 years after I put it in. This is one rare example in my series of acute bypass occlusion within the first few days after surgery. You can see the occluded bypass in the top left. <coughs> Excuse me. I took the patient straight back to the operating room, revised it, and now it's patent. And the patient actually did not, uh, did not deteriorate at all. Um, this is how delayed by, I'm going to come back to that in my data analysis. This is how delayed bypass occlusion may look like. Uh, this is, uh, the, the uh, bypass was patent first and over months or years, you can see the anastomosis becoming smaller and smaller. You can see the anterior STA branch that was not utilized in this bypass since it was in this case a 1D, 1R. You can then see the excellent, robust capillary blush from transdural indirect collaterals. 
And I'll come back to this point later. Why do some bypasses occlude in a delayed manner, uh, all except one patient asymptomatic? I've looked at TCD VMR. I, I, I show you the ranges where you want the VMR to be normally 70% or higher than mild impairment if it's lower. And you can read it for yourself, the ranges of TCD VMR. Uh, in COVID times, it was difficult to do TCD VMR due to equipment. So we use the breath holding index. It's simpler and it's simply a percentage increase in MCA velocity by TCD divided by number of seconds of apnea that the patient can tolerate. And normally you want a normal BHI to be about 0.69 or higher. And then, of course, I've looked at my patients in follow-up with CTA, angiogram, DSA, uh, MRA, depending. So 162 procedures, bilateral disease in 72. The clinical follow-up was almost three years mean, the range up to 21 years. Angiographic follow-up, not quite two years, one year and nine months. The longest range, 12 years, uh, 10 months. Of course, early on, I was doing less surgery. The first seven years, I did 14 surgeries. The next seven years, I did 41. And the last, and the last seven years, I did 107, uh, which is actually quite decent number for a North American series. Uh, of course, uh, nothing in numbers to compare to the Asian uh, experience. Uh, here is how I divided my patients. Uh, moya moya disease. Well, I don't need to tell you what moya moya disease is. It's uh, when you recognize it as idiopathic moya moya. Uh, uh, that's uh, MMD. Moya moya syndrome is when you have an identifiable cause for the moya moya uh, change. And the last column on your right, I'm calling SOD, steno occlusive, usually atherosclerotic disease. And the first column on the left is a. Uh, a summary of uh, is a summation of everything. You, I'm not going to read the demographics, the presenting symptoms, the comorbidities in, in each of the patient, uh, the MRS modified Rankine score preoperatively at the bottom. Uh, we've looked at uh, uh, angiographic uh, ourselves. We study, we restudied every angiogram that we could get hold of. We looked at, of course, all the studies angiographic analysis, the primary vessel affected, degree of stenosis, post-op Matsushima grade, post-op bypass patency at last follow-up. So <clears throat> pre-op, you can see the VMR was quite low, 29%. It means, hopefully, I was choosing patients appropriately for surgery, uh, patients who really needed surgery. I, I am sure my colleagues who have experience with bypass will agree, even though you do the perfect bypass, patients remains asymptomatic. Most of the time, the VMR does not normalize, at least the way we are measuring it. It got only a little bit better to 39%. So don't count on VMR to, in general, to tell you if the surgery has been successful. Of course, you need to see a good angiogram. You need to see disappearance of symptoms and sometimes regression of moya moya uh, vessels. As well, we looked at SPECT and CT perfusion. Here is the intraoperative information that I am most interested in, is the flow measurements. And uh, as I said, I, don't, I did 1D1R, 1D2R, 2D2R. STA is the most common donor sometimes occipital artery, sometimes posterior auricular artery, and all kinds of recipient locations. My suturing, mostly continuous running suture, sometimes, inter, you know, or interrupted or mixed. Here is interesting finding. Somatosensory evoked potential almost never changed during surgery. So I stopped using them now. There is no point doing SSEP uh, 
in these by I'm not talking about aneurysm and tumor bypasses. I'm talking about moya moya and and uh, steno occlusive disease. It's a waste of resources. 159 SSEP did not change even during temporary occlusion or during suturing. It decreased temporarily in one case. That's it, and and came back to normal. What was the cut flow? Median cut flow of the STA was 52 cc per minute. Total final bypass flow was 44 cc per minute. That is a cut flow index quite high of 0.86. So let's analyze the surgical morbidity. 30 day surgical morbidity, I lumped in every morbidity we could identify. I lump everything, we got 17 patients out of 162, that's about 10%. But let's analyze what, the, what that is. Ischemic stroke due to surgery only occurred in one patient, that's 0.6%. ICH due to surgery, 3.1%. Not all of them required evacuation, only two required evacuation, the others resolved. Subdural hematoma, wound complications, respiratory failure, and myocardial infarction, you, you lump everything together, uh, you get 10%. But if you look at ischemic stroke and ICH together, that's 3.7%, uh, of course, much, much lower than the cost results of 15%. I don't think I'm going to bore you analyzing here are we, our analysis of each case of, of complication. There was only one death. I will show you the video of the only mortality we had. It was with an unusual bonnet bypass with a saphenous vein. But uh, you can see hemorrhage, stroke, hemorrhage, 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 hemorrhage. Those were the six cases of either stroke or hemorrhage due to the surgery. This is a very significant finding. When we analyze collateral formation pre-op, we categorized it complete or incomplete. If it was complete, there was 36% delayed occlusion of the bypass asymptomatically, as I said, except for one patient. And if it was incomplete pre-op, there was only 4% delayed occlusion, meaning 96% patency. Now, you might say, you might jump to the conclusion, oh, well, then that's very easy. If they have complete collateralization, they don't need surgery. That is not the case. Remember, these patients were symptomatic, had poor VMR, and, but, but they happened to have complete collateralization uh, when we operated on them. So I still feel they need surgery, but perhaps the conclusion would be they don't need it as much as the other cases, and or they have the capacity, better than the other group, to grow indirect collaterals. And by doing the craniotomy, you're encouraging even more indir <laughs> indirect collaterals. But that could be a point of discussion, perhaps, when I finish my lecture. And here it shows it graphically very well. The orange is incomplete collateralization. The blue is complete. And on the right is uh, the, the patent. And on the left is a delayed occlusion. You can see a huge difference when you do the ratio of the two colors. What matters is how did the patients do? Well, the patients got better uh, in the series. MRS shifted to the left became better. Orange is post-op, blue is pre-op. And here is a detailed analysis of the three techniques, 1D1R, 1D2R, and 2D2R. Uh, there is nothing statistically significant between the three columns, but you can see a trend. You can see a trend of better uh, CFI, cut flow index, the more anastomoses you do, you can see a better trend for long-term patency. I have 100% long-term patency in the 2D2R, 92% in 1D2R, 
and 88% in 1D, 1R. <clears throat> when we looked at univariate and multivariate analysis to look at long-term patency, why do some patients occlude, uh, as I said, asymptomatically, usually long-term? Only two factors remained. One of them I cannot explain, and that's Hispanic race. Uh, most of my patients, many of my patients are Hispanic. I live in Miami. Uh, that I don't know if it will be maintained in other series, but in this series there was that effect. And the only other effect was the collateralization, complete versus incomplete. That was the strongest effect <coughs> that predicts long-term patency. Please note, and I will show it later in the talk, CFI, cut flow index, you can see it on the column above the yellow, had no effect on long-term patency. This is a complete uh, uh, contradistinction to the UIC, University of Illinois, Fadi Charbel uh, and Sepi Amin Hanjani series, where CFI was a strong predictor of long-term patency. I will come back to that in my analysis at the end. 1D1R example, what does that mean? I mean, I, I'm going to show you quickly uh, a video uh, of Moya Moya. Here is a Moya Moya. Simple incision over the posterior branch of the STA. I'm sorry, I said 1D1R. I meant 1D2R. We're going to do one donor, two recipient. Uh, I like to use the Colorado needle or I like to use the bipolar to uh, dissect this STA. Uh, of course, a lot uh, of this uh, is involved, we're involved in training as well. Here is the ICG, the STA cut flow. In this case was 50 cc per minute. When I cut the STA, uh, I like to open it this way. Usually a T or a C, I like to open the muscle, simple crany, open. Let me go to the important part. So identify two recipients. Now, this case that I'm showing you, the order of anastomoses were end to side first and side to side next. That's not how I do it now. The, I, at first, I wanted to, I was not sure if I needed a double anastomosis, so I did the end to side first. But as you will see in the second part of my talk, it gave me an opportunity to analyze the difference. Does it matter if you do side to side first and end to side next or the other way around? It does not make a difference, but it makes more sense to do the side to side first in general so that that anastomosis is flowing while you're doing the next anastomosis. The technique perhaps most of you are familiar with I am using a 10-0, uh, BV75 or 70-3, that's the name of the needle. We are going to do uh, an arteriotomy either with a disposable knife uh, or, or a beaver blade. We are going to do, uh, in this case, interrupted. Uh, unlike some of my colleagues, I don't like to do, to fix the toe. I only fix the heel. <coughs> And then we are going to, to do, in this particular case, interrupted. Many times, you know, we have to train fellows and residents and so forth. So it's important to do interrupted uh, as well. I like to use the diamond tipped uh, forceps because of no skidding. And we're going to do this wall. Then you measure the flow. We measure the flow and 43 cc per minute. Next, we're going to do the side to side to the temporal M4. You have to stop the flow when you do that. That's why it's not a good idea to do it in this order. Do it the other way, it's better. We open the side of the STA. Be careful not to injure the other side of the other wall of the STA. Make sure there is no air. And of course, you have to do generally running technique generally side to side although of course you can flip the vessel and uh, do it uh, uh, the normal way <clears throat> i very much like to use curved needle holders because it gives you an extra degree of freedom 
you approximate the heel, you take your suture behind the, uh, the needle behind the suture. If you're right-handed, you go out in on the left edge and in out on the right edge. If you're left-handed, you do the opposite and you run it and then you tighten the loops. At least that's the way I do it. I tighten the loops at the end and then the front wall is easy. You release this, now you measure flow. And the flow is, uh, uh, I think, 60 cc per minute, total flow. Remember, it was uh, 50 cut flow. So we obtained more than 100%. Here we go, 60 cc, we increased the flow that it could have given. And it divided itself 22 to the frontal lobe and 38 to the temporal lobe in this case. ICG, you do it again. And here is a summary of all the important numbers. I do this on every case. I categorize those numbers. And that's what I'm going to analyze the data. Here is a post-op angiogram. Both anastomoses are patent. That's immediate post-op angiogram. <clears throat> 2D, 2R video example. I think I'm going to skip. It's the same thing using end to side and end to side. I'm going to skip that video, uh, but you have to dissect the anterior branch. Um, a, a quick example of occipital artery to pica bypass for vertebrobasilar insufficiency. I'll go quickly over this one. Very severe vertebrobasilar ischemia and TIAs. The, v, the basilar is extremely small, poor circulation. Here is what we're going to do. We're going to take the occipital artery, do a far lateral approach. We're going to dissect the occipital artery. And, uh, and here is the pica. We're going to put a retractor on <coughs> the tonsil. We're going to clean up the field a little bit. And <coughs> it's important to realize where the pica perforators are. And bring the pica closer to you. So I am looking for the first major perforator of the pike, the last major, here it is. You cannot pull the pica closer to you more than this. Make the surgery easier by creating more room. And we are going to do an end to side. Uh, here is, by the way, the flow probe to know what your baseline is. I'm measuring how much occipital artery I need. And I'm just going to go jump to the end of this video. Here is an, uh, you have plenty of room there with these uh, bypasses. It's a lot easier than bypass to the PCA or the SCA. So here is the end to side anastomosis. And at the end, you measure the flow. And you, it's a very good flow. And I'll show you the angiogram. Here is a closure. Here is the, uh, the angiogram showing good patency. Bonnet bypass. This is my only mortality, and that is an anesthetic mortality. The patient was unfortunately allowed to wake up while I was doing the anastomosis, and you will see developed a severe posterior fossa hemorrhage. Uh, I am not going to show the entire video. There is no time, but this patient had occluded common carotid, so I did not have a good STA on the same side. The details are not important, just to show briefly the technique. This is the STA on the occluded common carotid side, very poor flow, 7 cc per minute. So I went to the other side. I knew I needed to do that. Here is the contralateral STA, and I'm going to use the bifurcation of it to put the saphenous vein, cross over, create a groove in the, in the skull so that the skin does not occlude the saphenous vein. Uh, I drill, you can see the drilled uh, groove in the bone. And actually I put plates on top of the vein so it doesn't kind of jump up. And it was during this Sylvian Fisher saphenous vein to M3 bypass that the patient unfortunately woke up. And even though the bypass, I completed the bypass quickly I want to show you what the complication is. Severe hypertensive crisis. And uh, 
look at what happened in the posterior fossa, unfortunately, and you can see the bypass is patent in the left, and the patient died four days later with this unfortunate uh, event. Uh, so, direct bypass is uh, <coughs> highly effective in select MMD, MMS, and SOD. Clinical presentation is a typical North American series. Incomplete collateralization on pre-op angio is a good predictor of patency. I want you to please compare the SOD group with the cost study. We seem to be doing a lot better. Uh, only one case had a poor recipient artery out of 162. So I'd like to differentiate. I want to compare and contrast with the UIC series because I was puzzled why the CFI did not predict long-term patency. Uh, the UIC series has 146 cases published in 2019. My current series is 161. Uh, here are the differences, I think. I have a higher, in, higher percentage of using 1D2R and 2D2R uh, technique. But I think the major difference is Sharbel and Amin Hanjani utilize concomitant EDAS along with the direct bypass in 35% of the cases. I don't. I only used it once, less than 1% of the cases. Follow-up length is similar. But interestingly, the, our, my long-term patency is 91%, theirs is 76%, and I'm not suggesting at all there is a better technique in my series. Uh, clearly, that is probably not the case, uh, but I think the concomitant use of EDAS is in their series may explain it. So you can see how the CFI of less than 0.5 in their series results in almost 54% in occlusion of bypasses. In my series, it's only 11% delayed occlusion, whatever the CFI is. So again, maybe we can discuss this when I finish the presentation. So those were my thoughts on what explains the discrepancy, the concomitant EDAS, and I utilize a little more 1D2R and 2D2R technique. I remind you, of, by the way, I this uh, the how did the patients do long term in my series? Only 6.2% overall post op, including the 3.7% morbidity mortality, had strokes or ICH. Uh, so about three point something percent after the morbidity mortality phase of 30 days had symptoms compared to what would have happened a natural history if we had not uh, uh, done the bypass, the more uh, would have been much, much higher. Um, we discussed that. Uh, to finish up, I want to show you new concepts quickly in the one, what I call 1D2R, a subcategory of the series. I've done it in 21. Now I've done it 26 cases, but this is the 21 cases. <coughs> Um, I am. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip some of these slides that remind us of the math and physics involved in bypass. Bernoulli equation, Hagen-Poiseuille law, you need to understand it well to make sense of what we are doing. You need to understand that Ohm's law uh, in, in electricity is identical to Poiseuille's law in concept. And uh, th this some of this material is in press being published in JNS. I'm going to skip uh, uh, computational flow dynamics in bypass, what's the importance of geometry, donor recipient ratio, causes of failure. A lot of this we learned from the cardiac literature. The important thing is to create less turbulence, less stagnation, and a more physiologic wall shear stress. I'm sorry, these are lots of details. I think for today I will skip that, but this is very important and I encourage you to read that literature to understand what does it mean, wall shear stress? Why do vessels seem to want to reach 15 dyne per centimeter square of wall shear stress after you do your bypass, regardless of where you start off? 
You can start off high in your Walsh stress or low. It seems to want to normalize. That is the goal of the biologic system. This is a formula of wall shear stress. Important thing from a surgeon's point of view, keep the angle of anastomosis low, near 30 degree. Dorner to recipient ratio between 1.5 to 2. Keep it as short as possible to minimize resistance. Fish mouth the donor. Place the sutures closer at the toe and the heel. That's why whether you do an end to side, you should fish mouth because of the cross-sectional area is four times as big. End to end, you should bevel and side to side, you don't have a choice. You have to do running on the back wall. That's how I do side to side. I do the arteriotomies where it's red. So this, this series of 21 cases, again, resident and fellow, uh, I'm gonna skip. This is what it looks like, 1D2R when you finish. You have two anastomoses, one donor, uh, again, uh, I showed you a video example. I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip that, but he, I'm going to show you the data. I apologize. Some of the slides are repetitive. I did not know if I'm going to have enough time. Um, here is here are the steps of a 1D2R, and this is in the paper. Uh, you do you line the STA. You do the end to side. The end. I'm sorry. The side to side first. You measure the flow. Then you do the end to side first. You measure the flow. It means you're going to have two separate CFI, the intermediate CFI and the final CFI. When I looked at the results of that, of those 1D2R, we're skipping this data, 100% uh, immediate patency, 90% delayed patency. The intermediate cut flow index was 0.64. When I did the second anastomosis, it went up to 0.94. <coughs> so increase the CFI. The M modified rank and score improved. <coughs> <coughs> the overall donor to recipient flow increased on average by 50%. So adding that second anastomosis was very beneficial. You see in graphic format what happens. The cut flow was 57 on the left. After the first anastomosis, flow is 36. You do the second anastomosis, total flow goes up again to 51.5. Whether you do end to side or side to side first, it did not matter. This is orange and blue, but I encourage you to do side to side first. If you know in advance you are going to do a double anastomosis and the clinical outcomes are improved. And the, in the supplementary material, when the paper comes out, I encourage you to read the various formulae of resistance and the equivalence with an electric resistance and resistance in series and in parallel. It's very easy to calculate the resistance of each portion of the circuit. And these are the different uh, formulas and the benefit. But I want to introduce two new concepts, SERA and SASI. SERA is Second anastomosis relative augmentation, S-A-R-A, -A, you divide CFI final by CFI initial, uh, intermediate. That will tell you how much more flow you created by the second anastomosis. And a second concept, new concept is SASI, S-A-S-I, second anastomosis sink index. You divide the final flow in the second anastomosis by the total final flow, it will indicate how much sink effect there was. They're related concepts, but if you look at the formulas that are in the paper, you will see they're not the same. They are both useful. And uh, uh, this is a typical case that matured. This only one patient occluded bilaterally. Here is a patient, the same patient occluded both sides in a delayed manner at one year because he developed excellent direct, I mean, sorry, indirect flow. And here is a comparison of 1D1R, 2D2R, and 1D2R. What are the advantages and disadvantages of 1D2R? I would suggest if you're a beginner in bypass surgery, don't do 1D2R. You need some experience because if you, if you damage the donor, you will lose both anastomoses. 
there is no point doing 1D2R if the bifurcation of the STA is at the level of your craniotomy. And you shouldn't do it if the STA is really very small. Um, so very important hemodynamic effect, shortening the L, decreasing the R, and this will give you excellent SARA of 1.79 and SASI of 0.4 when you utilize this technique. And I think I am just about on time. And to conclude, please don't give up bypass surgery. Uh, if you're an experience had, it has experience had, it has a high immediate patency rate. It is important to measure flow measurement, uh, flow during surgery so you can understand the physiology of what you are doing. The concept of CFI is interesting and puzzling, particularly when you compare my series with the UIC series. Uh, I cannot give you my opinion on indirect bypasses because I don't use them. Uh, many of you uh, use a lot of them and I'm sure have more wisdom about it, but I have no use for it based on my data. It's a great mistake to abandon bypass surgery. You just have to select your patient appropriately and enroll them in a registry uh, so we can analyze the data uh, prospectively. Thank you very much for this invitation. And I look forward to any questions or discussion you may want to have. Yes. Oops, let me go. OK, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, wonderful lectures. Uh, you, the, I think uh, the low cut flow index means that uh, the two factors. Uh, one, one is a uh, very high, uh, very high uh, peripheral resistance, <coughs> and uh, the the peripheral resistance is induced by a very good collateral flow or the very uh, narrow uh, peripheral vessels like uh, due to a uh, atherosclerotic change. So the preoperative angiogram shows that uh, uh, the some part of the, uh, the cerebral vessel have the uh, uh, severe stenosis or a very slow flow. Uh, this means that uh, that part has a very uh, severe atherosclerotic change. So the, we can predict that uh, uh, the, such, such an area may have the uh, low cut flow index after the anastomosis, right? Right, right. So, so what, I mean, I, the, I think the first time I, I saw you, uh, Rokua, show uh, side-to-side -side anastomosis. I don't remember when you started using it uh, several years ago, uh, the side-to-side -side STA. And I was curious, what, did, do you have a similar experience to me in uh, that the flow increases when you add a second anastomosis? And what are your thoughts on this whole concept? Uh, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, I, I haven't, I haven't, not yet, not yet. Oh, you My, haven't. I, I seem to. Maybe I must have missed. You've oh, you've not done side to side. I seem to remember in one course. I must be mistaken. Uh, I maybe, maybe I have once in uh, something yeah. Helsinki. Okay. Yeah, because okay. Because of uh, yeah, because of something a poor the donor, but uh, usually I do a double barrel bypass. Right. So uh, the rarely I have uh, such experience. So uh, and. Uh, when I have uh, the, such a side-to-side -side anosmosis and end-to-side anosmosis, finally, uh, the, I haven't got the, the exact flow metric. So yeah. I, I don't have the exact answer, so I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway, yeah, that's... yeah, yeah, but uh, the, I understand what you mean. Yeah, it, it may happen. And uh, it's, uh, we, we, have to, we have to have the... Uh, the investigation investigations uh, in this near future. Yeah, yeah. I'm hope. I mean, I don't know if I'm the only person who has. I mean, Fadi Sherbel was the first to publish it in 2018. Uh, he published seven or eight cases uh, of what, what I'm. Co he called it SV 
DA, I think, single vessel double anastomosis. I found it easier to call it 1D, 2R. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious how many surgeons utilize the technique. I would love to see if the SERA and SASI measurements yeah. will be useful for us to, you know, to, to study prospectively. Yeah. I, 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 Shu Bin, I mean, I know Shu Bin, I think similarly does double uh, direct end to side anastomosis. He's not going to waste his time doing side to side, correct, Shu Bin? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you still remember it. Yeah. I normally uh, do the, uh, you call the 2D to R. Yes. So sometimes I use one single. Uh, long branch to create 2D to R. Right. But yeah. is one of your anastomosis side to side or end to side? Or are they always end to side? I always uh, use uh, end to side. Yeah. Because, you know, I think the parallel uh, uh, 2D to R is a parallel uh, flow. So it's uh, uh, more for the uh, donor artery. I think it's more convenient to get the bigger flow than yes. in one single branch. Yeah. Perhaps, but you know, I, as you know, sometimes you get healing problems when the skull mm -hmm. is completely devascularized. And, you know, in, in the hands of people who don't do as many as you or Rokua do, it's, it's sometimes they find, the, the young surgeons will find it tedious to go find the anterior branch and pull it out of under the scalp and it's extra surgery. That's why yeah, I yeah. thought we'll analyze, uh, you know, we'll try to do it 1D, 2R. Sometimes yeah. I use uh, one, one branch, one single uh, parrot, uh, normally I use a parietal branch to create, cut one segment to do a end to side so I can uh, create another branch. So this is a two, two D two R. Actually, right. it's a, yeah, not the uh, both the frontal and the parietal branch. I understand. I yeah. got it. Yeah, because of ischemic problem, uh, skin is uh, the big problem after the yes. harvest double, double branches of STA. So uh, uh, one D two R is uh, the one of a solution to avoid uh, such a ischemic complication of the wound. So uh, the, the, we can consider the, which one, uh, uh, which, which case is appropriate to use the uh, one to t, uh, one to 2R and uh, the 2D2R. The, we, we have to carefully consider it. And I have one, one more question, Jack. Uh, yes. The, because of a failure of a cost study, uh, the, I have read the paper af after the course study, and uh, I was so surprised that uh, the non-stroke non non-stroke group have the average temporary occlusion time or bypass was more than fifty minutes, and yeah. uh, stroke stroke group has uh, the short shortest average time around the 40, 45 minutes. Anyway, the there no, the other way around, Rokoa. The, the, uh, it was the other way around. 55 minutes was the mean occlusion time in the stroke group, mm -hmm. and 45 minutes was the mean average occlusion time in the non-stroke group, both mm -hmm. of which are, of course, very long. The problem yeah. is there was no statistical difference, but there was a clear trend. Yeah. The problem... But you know what? They had high patency rate of 96% in yeah. spite of those long occlusion times. Uh, and you know, when you look at the, uh, we were not in the cost study, our center, but I mean, there are many experienced surgeons in that list. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it is extremely long. I mean, my fellow, my fellow does it in 30 minutes. So, yeah. you know, yeah. It, it's... <laughs> yeah, I know. So uh, the, I think uh, the, 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 there are there may be a, might be a, the many programs that many programs that uh, but uh, I think uh, that to 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 achieve uh, to achieve a good result uh, we need to uh, 
very strict eligibility selection. Agree. Of, of, of a neurosurgeon. So the I, I, I in my personal <laughs> hope that we need a one more one more a big study like a cause or a, a Japanese jet study. Well, I mean, what happened? To, I, I kept asking many of my Chinese colleagues, and I don't know if you, what happened to CMOS, CM, the Chinese, uh, what I call it, the Chinese cost. I don't know what the results are. Wasn't there a study going on? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah we, are, know, know. Yeah, we, we are, are still waiting the yeah. results. Yeah. We, we are doing the statistics right now. Okay, we will wait. Let us know when it's done here. Shall we stay online till you tell us? <laughs> okay. Uh, we, uh, we talk too much. I, I think uh, uh, Raja is confusing. Uh, we have to go on, move right. on to our next, next lecture, thank, right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcos and Dr. Tanika and Dr. Shubin and everybody who joined us. It was a wonderful discussion and a very interesting talk. Nice to meet you, Professor Weini. I would like to move on to the sec uh, next session. Topic two is an carotid surgery okay. and the presenter is Professor Ni yeah. Wei as introduced by Raja. So uh, as you know, uh, carotid atherosclerosis is common in Western countries and comprise about 20% of all ischemic strokes. And it has long been uh, accepted that atherosclerosis in intracranial arteries in common, but the carotid atherosclerosis is relatively rare in Japanese population. However, patients with carotid disease in Japan have been gradually increasing, pro probably due to the westernization of the Japanese diet, lifestyle change, and the rapidly aging society. And maybe I think the situation is the same in China and uh, many other Asian countries. So I'm really looking forward to listening to Professor Wei's lecture. Professor Wei, please start your lecture. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the distinguished uh, professors, and uh, Professor Xu especially, for, and the organizers who invite me to, for here for this course. And thanks, thanks to the professor for the brief introduction. And I've really been the, uh, first of all, I should say, I really like this course webinar uh, and learned a lot from this series. So I really appreciate um, this opportunity to share my, my experience this evening. And my topic is the surgical strategy for the carotid atherosclerosis. I am the attending neurosurgeon of the Department of Neurosurgery, Ashen Hospital. And this is a, my major specialty is uh, cerebral vascular surgery and neural intervention. Now, this is, uh, I have no disclosure. And uh, now the stroke is a major problem and cause heavy burden in China. As we see, there is a really high incidence uh, of stroke in the mainland of this country. And this is the data from the report of the third national review of the cause of the death in China. And you can see stroke occupies 22 of all various disease in the total number. And the incidence of the stroke is increasing at an annual rate of 8.7. And the growth rate is faster than our GDP, which was reported by our government last year. So let's move on. The carotid lesion is one of the major causes of stroke. And the pathology of this lesion in this region is mainly the atherosclerosis. And besides that, and dissection or vasculitis are also the reasons for the carotid lesions. But they are not included in my topic today. And according to the radiological uh, presentations, we classified it into the carotid stenosis or carotid occlusion. So the, for the carotid atherosclerosis, we believe that medical treatment is always the first, first choice since the development of the antiplatelet medicines and the stentings. And they are the basis of the stroke prevention and treatment. So in the guideline, which was updated this month, we can see some recommendations with high grade uh, evidence regarding uh, the intensive medical treatment. So that means the medication is still the first line therapy for most of the patients. And surgery is indicated for some patients who really need surgery. 
and no matter CA, CAS or, or bypass, our purpose is to prevent or reduce the ischemic attack. But how to determine the treating strategy and how to choose our skills to solve the carotid problems and how to balance the pearls and pitfalls of these uh, different treating methods. Uh, these questions are always what we concern a lot. So the dis dispute, uh, the dispute in the history of uh, in the history of the carotid surgery is the CDA and CAS, which is better. The surgeon and the neuro radiologist may have different answers, but the goals for these two different treatments is the same and to anatomically recanalize the carotid artery and get a rapid, a rapid uh, recovery of the cerebral perfusion. So the technical details of CA is no need for more introduction. And as early in 1991, this is a paper which published in the, in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. And the priority of CEA compared with the medication was confirmed in the number of patients who had a 70 of more than 70% of stenosis in the proximal ICA. This has been confirmed. And later, the clinical trials showed if for the patient with less than 50% of stenosis, that the effect of CA is not certain. But in the endovascular uh, era, the CAS emerged and revolutionized the carotid surgery. And a number of clinical trials are organized to, to compare the CA and CAS. And most of them showed similar results and they reflect the advantage and drawbacks of these two treating methods. For instance, this is the, the press research, we, which we are, we are familiar with. Uh, this is one of the most typical research regarding the comparison of CAS and CEA. And it contains, we can see the uh, 108 centers in US and nine in Canada. And the final result is, is not beyond our anticipation that the CAS and CA are both safe and sustainable. So, and myocardial infarction is more likely to happen in CEA and CAS is safer in younger patients. And this is another typical research ICSS randomized trial and enrolled uh, 17, 13 cases, one, one by one randomization and 50 centers worldwide. And showing the CAS may have higher incidence of uh, treatment related stroke, but lung functional outcome and risk of severe stroke is almost equal. And this is in 20, uh, to, uh, 2016, and this is a crest reported via full up data which also showed the CEA caused lower incidence of perioperative stroke and the CAS caused fewer myocardial infarctions. But the rate of the primary endpoint is almost the same. So we can see the CAS may cause higher rates of stroke, but no significant difference of the neurological outcomes uh, between these two groups. So, and the, Restenosis rate is also uh, all, is nearly the same. So, like the sumo game, then both the CAA and the CAS are the giants in this competition. But it is hard to figure out which one is stronger. And currently, we have reached a consensus that the CAA is still the gold standard for the treatment of the uh, ICS stenosis. And we can see the goal of CAA is to eliminate or reduce the severe carotid artery stenosis, and then re restore the blood flow and improve the brain perfusion, and then remove the plaque to prevent the risk of embolism. And we can see in this slide, describe the indication uh, and contraindication in, uh, in our center for CA. And we can see the indications with the repeated uh, unilateral TI attack and carotid artery stenosis for more than 70%. If the patient have the 50 to 70% of stenosis with symptoms and imaging of the imaging evidence of ulcerative plug, we will do the 
is CA as well. And the counter indication is the acute severe stroke with other serious company disease or stenosis segment extend beyond the metal uh, angle to the skull base. And, and the carotid artery is completely occluded with no distal flow. It's also the contraindication. And if some patients with long segment of sex stenosis involving the hypoglossal nerve, uh, we also use the shifting technique to achieve successful endocterectomy. But CAS still plays a very important role in the ICA stenosis. We are willing to uh, regard it as a good compensation of the CEA, since it can really treat some patients who are, who, who are not suitable for the CEA, and such as the high carotid stenosis or the traumatic or iatrogenic er uh, carotid stenosis with the carotid dissecting aneurysm or inadequate fibrosis the tissue formation of the carotid intima or bilateral severe stenosis or the stenosis caused by tumor compression or some patients with very, very bad uh, general condition. And the other important indication is the re-stenosis after the CA. So uh, as we know, it is very hard for us to, to re-approach ICA within the same incision and CAS may be a good alternative. Here we show two cases of the specific uh, indication for CAS. And the left side is a case of high positioned stenosis. It is nearly, nearly uh, impossible for CA, but a good candidate for the CAS. And the right side is a case of bilateral stenosis and CAS is safer because no need for temporary occlusion during the procedure. So how to correctly and rationally know about the relationship between these two techniques, CEA and CS, is extremely important for me as a neurosurgeon and radiologist. And you can see CA remains the first choice in most cases. Uh, actually, this is uh, also the same with our clinical practice. And CAS has the advantage over CA in some typical cases. So at present, they are the complementary, we think. So CA can be the rescuing treatment in patients with re stenosis uh, after the CAS. And on the contrary, and the others uh, in the right side, you can see the CAS can be the useful for the post CA stenosis. So we believe a uh, best surgeon can make different technique co cooperate perfectly and uh, individually in the selected patient. So the other topic today is the carotid occlusion. So I think it is a far more interesting than the stenosis because it involves some exciting new techniques reflecting the involvement in this field. And for some cases, uh, if you are lucky enough, CEA is enough for the recanalization like this case. This is a 70 year old male, intermittent right limb numbness and weakness for, for, for more than five years. And you can see from the DSA very severe uh, stenosis uh, occlusion and the proximal from the proximal ICA to the ophthalmic segment, and we just use the CA to uh, run plug, and we can see the very good retrograde flow from the distal ICA, and then we complete the surgery. And this is case for the recanalization rec by the CAS alone. This is a 62 year old uh, male left limb. Uh, numbness and uh, left limb, uh, left, uh, with the left limb dizziness and onset and for vision for more than two months. And this is uh, the DSA also showed very severe uh, uh, occlusion of the proximal ICA and to the uh, ophthalmic segment. And this picture showed the occlusion segment is quite long. And we use the C uh, the recanalization with endovascular treatment. We use the microwire, microcatheter. Uh, we let the microwire go through the occlusion segment, and very lucky we find the the true lumen of the occlusion.
occluded artery, and then use the gateway to dilate the uh, to dilate the vessels, and then deploy the stent to recanalize the ICA. So sometimes a CS alone is in, is adequate for the recanalization, re but a little bit difficult, like uh, this case. So the technical studies on the endovascular recanalization of the chronic occlusion of ICA uh, has been reported for many years. Uh, here, this is Shojima from Japan reported their recanalization procedure. This is schematic diagram, including how to use the balloon protection and dilation to recanalize. And this paper also showed a modified angiographic classification for the endovascular recanalization of ICA. And this classification is based on the length of the stenotic uh, segment and whether there is a stump. And this is also another classification uh, system reported by, the, uh, by our Chinese scholars. It, it is also based on the occlusion lens and the collateral feeding from PCOM and ACOM. So in the past 10 years, uh, many, many Chinese radiologists showed tremendous curiosity for the endovascular recanalization, much more enthusiastic than the Western countries. Why? Since the case number of the chronic IC occlusion in China is really high, but the success rate is not satisfactory. So, like this case, we uh, this case we we did several years. We used the balloon dilation technique to to, to we want to recanalize the ICA, but we failed finally, and then we had to perform a, a bypass for this case. But now things maybe change because the hybrid time comes, and the hybrid unit makes the extravascular and endovascular techniques as a combination and warrants more chances for recanalization of these chronic IC occlusion. So look at the history of the hybrid recanalization. It was a firstly reported by the team from Taiwan, China. And they reported three cases of ICA chronic occlusion and recanalized by a hybrid technique using the, the, balloon, uh, the, the CEA to remove the plug and then uh, using the blown dilation and then put the stand. It all succeeded. And the, afterwards, another Chinese hospital proposed the indication for hybrid, uh, uh, for hybrid operation for the uh, ICA chronic occlusion. And they performed a, a number of cases, we think. And uh, although this is a publication in Chinese, but it has a great influence on the clinical practice right now. And this is also a Chinese team from Shanghai Military Hospital. And they made a classif classification for the uh, chronic IC occlusion and find the recanalization of non taper or non stump IC occlusion with the hybrid technique was more successful than the endovascular alone uh, with fewer uh, perioperative uh, complications. And this slide also showing here is also from a Chinese team in Beijing. And they proposed the new classification of IC occlusion and raised a new algorithm for the recanalization strategy and different grade show different successful uh, success rate we can see in the uh, in the right side why are we so keen on the hybrid operation for these patients we have several reasons firstly we're using the ca can remove the plug and guide the wire is easy to enter the true lumen of the ICA. For the endovascular treatment, we can see the, mo the most important drawbacks is we cannot figure out whether the microwire goes into the true lumen or the false lumen. So if we perform CA, we open the neck, we open the carotid artery, we can easily figure out which one, which is the true lumen. And 
using the endovascular technique to deal with the intracranial lesion is very important under the X-ray. And uh, adjusting the strategy during the operation uh, because we can easily uh, handle two techniques uh, very efficiently. And besides that, the revolutionary imaging technique can also tell us the components of the occluded lumen, in the occluded lumen, and different signals hints different uh, ingredients in the plug, helping us figure out uh, which one is classified or which one is fibrose. And this increased our confidence before the recanalization. So it's based on the experience of chi our Chinese colleagues and our own, uh, we propose our indication for the hybrid operation on the chronic IC occlusion. It includes that the uh, repeated ischemic symptoms related to the, to, the, to the chronic IC occlusion and cause of death should be more than four weeks. And we should have the DSA confirm the patency of the MCA without any moya moya change. And we should confirm the hypoperfusion or hypermetabolism confirmed by our CT perfusion or, or PET. Or, and we should, should, should confirm the retrograde flow to the cavernous segment or lower enter or lower or retrograde flow to the MCA. Um, and high resolution MRI show no classification and, uh, and the fibrosis in the occluded segment. And the contraindication may be the acute infarction on the chronic occlusion side. And this is a very typical case as the 16 year old male repeated uh, TIAs after the dual antiplatelet therapy. And from the MRI, you can see the left IC occluded. And we recanalized this patient in the hybrid unit. And this very, this. This patient conformed to the to our indication. We can see the retrograde flow from the ophthalmic artery from ECA to the ophthalmic artery, and then the retrograde flow can reach to the petrous segment and lower than the uh, uh, cavernous segment. And this is a high resolution MRI in the neck. We can see there is no calcification, uh, and we can see a very this uh, very obvious uh, true lumen of flow void uh, shade in the, in, in the distal ICA. So we use the technique, the CEA technique. Firstly, open the ICA. I'll move on very quickly and then remove the plug. And at this time, the guiding is in the proximal CCA. After removed plug, we can see this is the guiding, uh, six, French, uh, six French guiding. And then the micro wire with the uh, microcatheter go distally to the ICA and we find the true lumen And then we can easily uh, dilate the ICA and then put several stents to re reconstruct the patency of the ICA. And the final result showed very good, very promising result of the, the ICA patency. And we also uh, proposed our treating flow chart after we puncture the, the former artery and the guiding we will put guiding into the CCA, and then we perform the CEA at first to remove the plug of the proximal ICA. And if we see the good, good retrograde flow, and then we will perform DSC. If there is no stenosis in the distal ICA, then we will finish. If with the stenosis, we can put the stent in the, uh, to reconstruct the ICA. If uh, after CA, if there is very poor retrograde flow, then we will firstly do the thrombectomy by the balloon, we, the, the inflated balloon, and then pull back to do the thrombectomy. And then if we see the growth retrograde flow, and then we'll perform DSA to, to figure out whether there is a stenosis, and then we, we will decide to finish or, or put the stand. 
if after the thrombectomy, there is also very poor grade, retrograde flow, then we'll, we will detecting the true lumen by the microwire. And if we success, uh, we will perform the blue dilation and stenting. So, but we have to admit that ICA recanalization is still challenging for us, even in the hybrid unit. There are still some cases we cannot achieve success. And from the biggest series in China reported here by the Tiantan Hospital, and the, the successful rate is just about nearly about 80%. That means 20% of the patients should look, should look for uh, some other way to treat. And by we believe that the recanalization by CA or CAS can rescuing or preserving the anatomic patency. And so they are the first choice. And in some cases, maybe intracranial, extracranial vascular bypass surgery is very, is have a good result can be achieved. So the development of the hybrid operation room is very encouraging in these kinds of patients. And finally, I still have some talks, have to talk about the bypass in the ICL occlusion. And we can see the Yasagio and Donaji in 1967, the first intracranial extracranial uh, vascular bypass surgery in the world. But very disappointing, we can see from two uh, very important clinical trials was showed no benefit of EIAB of the chronic IC occlusion. But there was lots of uh, disputes on the result of these two trials. And one is dispute is regarding on the indications of these patients. Uh, so the indicate uh, the failure of cost is likely to attribute to that of the sense semi quantitative and hemispheric evaluated OEF, and it could not accurately screen for these for those with the hemodynamic compromise. And the other dispute is on the endpoint. A lot of patients are evaluated perioperative stroke, but with no imaging evidence. And did they really suffer stroke or just the hypoperfusion syndrome? So animate, uh, eliminating from the analysis uh, of the 12 surgical patients who had stroke within two days after the surgery. Uh, and if we calculate, uh, calculate the rates of the recurrent stroke for the remaining 80, if 81 patients in the surgical group has 9% compared with the 22% in men's uh, surgical group. So some of the endpoint is misunderstand in this, in this trial, we think. So like the Professor Lawton said, the surgeon should not exclude the patient with very severe stenotic and occlusive cerebrovascular disease, but should actively look for the evidence to support the surgery. So, we have performed a, the a bypass surgery for the chronic IC occlusion for more than 10 years. And this is the indication in our hospital. We choose some symptomatic cases with the recurrent uh, TIA or the cognitive in, impairment or mild, mild to moderate in function, not efficient after the regular uh, medication. And we have the DSC confirmed ICA occlusion or MC occlusion or high grade stenosis and not treatable by the CA or the endovascular treatment. Very importantly, we have the hemodynamic impairment, uh, which is me measured by the TCD or CT perfusion, MR perfusion, ASL, SPECT or the uh, PET for, the, for measuring whether the patient have the hypometabolism. And in contraindication is the severe general systematic disease or acute phase of the severe stroke within one month or the NIST score more than 15. So this is a which you're interested about the CMOS. Uh, this is this a clinical trial began from uh, 2011, but actually uh, it ended maybe two years, uh, one year ago because some of the problem for the enrollment, but now we are doing the statistic uh, work and it will be maybe uh, we will announce a, 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 in the late of this year. And from the, from some of the data, 
in this clinical trial, we also uh, published some papers about uh, uh, the superficial temporal middle cerebral artery uh, bypass surgery for the refractory symptomatic intracranial atherosclerotic stenosis. So we tried to attempt to extend the bypass indication from the occlusive disease to the stenotic disease. So for uh, we can see from this from this series bypass may uh, uh, may may ameliorate the symptoms of uh, ischemia provides a new treatment strategy for the appropriate patient and may also promote the early occlusion of the appropriate vessel. This is the, the result of, of this paper uh, from the CMOS data. But we should concern the complication rate is the major problem of the ERAB uh, in these kinds of patients. We can see from our experience, the abnormal perfusion syndrome may be as high as 50%, 20 to 50%, and cerebral infarction 2.44 to 6%, and intracranial hemorrhage uh, may be 0.3 to 2.3, and ep epileptic seizures um, a little bit higher than and 10%. So the fact of higher complication rate after the CEBF reconstruction is not a denial of the operation itself or the surgeon's technique, but in patterns for improving the surgical strategy. So is there any problems in the surgical strategy for the, for the ERAB? So is the perfusion assessment enough? So we look back to the history of EIAB. It, it, we experienced three periods of time. The first period is the, the bypass technique arise and the future is full of hope and brightness. And the second period, it, the number of cases grow very, very rapidly. And there is a controversy about these kind of techniques using different in different patients. And then we explore and we persist. And this is the third period of time. This technique should be mature and we need very more clear treatment and more efficient technique to improve this technique. So the current concept of AIAB, so firstly is the blood flow. We, we should figure out the relationship between the blood flow and the hemodynamics. And then we should move on to the uh, to, to the field of the blood flow and the metabolism. And then we should pay attention to the uh, blood flow and the function, which are the relationship between these two matters. So we are using different techniques uh, to make our bypass more precise so we use a comprehensive evaluation of a technique to, to evaluate the disease condition from the multiple levels. Firstly, we use DSA MRI uh, to evaluate the vessel condition. The other is the blood condition. We use ASL, we use PET. We measure the local perfusion and neuronal metabolic state. And then we should, uh, we should evaluate the structure we use a T1, a DTI, and plus a cell body and axon formology of the neurons. And then we will uh, pay attention to the function. We use the function MRI and EEG. So we raised our new concept of the multimodal integrated bypass. So we put several uh, model to inside, the, inside our surgery. First, we will do the vessel examination using the MRI or the DSA, and then using the perfusion or the metabolism to show the blood condition of these patient, and then use the functional MRI to uh, assess the structure and the function of the brain. And then we'll, we put this, we'll, we put these technique together using the MRI to MRI to, local, to, to do the localization and it, it evaluate the local function and the perfusion of the brain. And we can also use this, use this uh, imaging technique to 
figure out the distribution of the recipient vessels. And then we perform the ASL pad. Also, we do the, 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 the purpose of this technique is also the uh, relocalization. We want to use the pad to figure out uh, which part of the brain is, is more hunger, more hungry for the uh, flow enhancement. And then use the EcoG or EEG to monitoring during the operation and uh, to, to measure the local neuronal function. And we can detect the athletic wave and then we use the ICG, interoperative ICG with the flow 800 technique to measuring the flow patency and the flow velo uh, velocity. So we put these, all these together the, the MR we build up the muscle and the brain structure. And then this is the cerebral perfusion using the uh, ASL. And then we use the navigation system to figure out which part of the brain is with the most hyperperfusion. And then we will choose this part, this part of the brain as the uh, uh, recipient, uh, uh, where we choose the recipient artery. So this is the, our current bypass surgery right now. Firstly, we perform the, uh, the MRI, uh, the preoperative MRI. We use ASL and then the PET to localize where we, which area is the hypoperfusion and hypometabolism. And then we use the for 800 to figure out which vessel is, the, with, is with the lowest flow. And then this is the EEG to figuring out which one, uh, which point with the, the lowest uh, dual activity. So this is my conclusion and the medication treatment is always the basis for the ICA pathologies. So both the CA and CAS are safe and effective and can be complementary. And for the occlusive lesions, saving and preserving the anatomic patency should be the first choice and the hybrid operating unit is promising for the selected cases and more precise EIAB can be investigated for the chronic IC occlusion. And this is the, our group. Uh, I am from the doctor group in, of the Huashan Neurosurgery and this all the staff. And uh, thank you, for, uh, thanks to, uh, I appreciate their work in their previous 10 years. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Lei. Uh, you are a very excellent lecture and a fascinating lecture. And uh, I have many, many questions, but time is limiting. And first, uh, to indication for carotid artery stenosis, you mentioned uh, only for symptomatic cases. So how do you think about indication for asymptomatic carotid, carotid stenosis in China? Uh, we will... For these kinds of patients, if the patient have the more than six, uh, six seventy percent of stenosis, mm -hmm. we will we will be aggressive to these kind of cases, mm -hmm. uh, as the as mentioned uh, in the in the in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. We we are the same. But as you and know, we also do the we will do the cognitive cognitive uh, mm -hmm. evaluation for all all of these ischemic patients. And most of the patients, if they they don't have the ischemic symptoms, but they, they may have the cognitive problems, impairments sometimes. And these are also the very uh, strong indication. So in the latter part of your lecture, you mentioned about the high resolution problem, isn't it? Uh, in, the, in the hybrid operation. And, uh, yeah. As you know, the, uh, not only uh, passing to stenosis, but also prep char characteristics is a very important factor for the risk for future ischemic event. So do you use prep characterization for selecting patients for, for CA or CAS in your institution? Or 
only based on the percent stenosis. So, yes, we we use uh, uh, for these kinds of patients. We use uh, several uh, several uh, examinations to 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 do the uh, to to choose the indicators. Uh, first mm -hmm. of the first is the uh, perfusion. And we were okay. uh, figuring out which kind of the uh, patient have the hypoperfusion or mm -hmm. hyperbolism of these kinds of, uh, uh, of the brain function, whether the brain function is impaired. And the other is the vessel condition. Vessel condition, we do the uh, DSA and we can see whether these patients have, these patients have the, the very typical features like the stump or the tapered, uh, or the tapered structure. It means if the patient have the stump or the tapered tapered uh, features, it will be easy to recanalize by the uh, by the by the endovascular treatment because the wire is easy to uh, pass these features to these tapered tapered segment. And uh, the other the, the last thing is the a uh, high resolution MRI and. We are very. We have a very experienced team for the high resolution MRI evaluation, and they can and tell us whether these uh, the stenotic lesion is uh, the integrants of the stenotic patient, whether it is the calcified, calcified or fibrosis, mm -hmm. and whether whether this thrombosis is the red thrombosis or the white one. So if the patient have the Red, red thrombosis, then we will be aggressive. If the white one, we will be conservative. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So I'm especially interested in the hybrid surgery with, uh, with high resolution MRI for uh, chronic ICO, IC, IC occlusion. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you, you select patient uh, using the high resolution MRI assessment. But so my question is actually, what percent of the patient is indicated for this hybrid surgery? About uh, maybe 50. less than maybe less than fifty percent. Less than fifty percent. Uh, I see. I see. Yes, less than fifty percent. Okay. So, but. Uh, I have many questions, but uh, time is limiting. So uh, I would like to uh, discuss with you another chance. So thank you for your excellent lecture, Professor Wei. So thank I'd like to close you. the second session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yoshida, for chairing this uh, webinar and Professor Navy for this excellent discussion. The discuss topic is open for discussion. We can have questions for both the speakers as Professor Marcos is still with us. Yes, Professor Atul Goel is here. We are honored to have him today. Professor Goel, your comments. Yeah, I really enjoyed both these lectures. There is no question bypass surgery for uh, both Moya Moya disease and for ischemic diseases is still evolving and controversies and questions are still there and too many. And it is very good that uh, some of the leaders of bypass surgery of the world, like Tanikawa, Binzu, my dear Wei, who gave a very wonderful presentation, I enjoyed. And Jack Marcos, I am not sure. Jack, you are there. I'm Jack. here, my friend. Yeah. So Jack, basically, <laughs> basically, I came to see you and see your recent work on bypasses. And for the first time, actually, I heard you talking on this subject. So my question comes to you, my dear friend. You see, Moya Moya disease, as we all know, is a very unbelievable kind of disease. And the treatment is also very unusual. Bypasses, of course, are the best form of treatment. I'm wondering, you see, the greatest revolutionary work done by Spetzler in his entire career, I will say, was indirect bypasses for Moya Moya disease. I am wondering how it works and how it works beautifully and how it works and gives extracranial supply to intracranial blood vessels so beautifully. And almost always, 
you think indirect bypasses should, should be neglected or should be kept in the sideline because indirect bypasses are also fantastic. Myosin angiosis and all those things can give very beautiful outcome. And I am uh, having a feeling that bypasses can be done, of course, but synangiosis and can cannot be put in the sidelines. What is your opinion on this? Um, they certainly can work, but there is wonderful work from Peter Vashkozy in Berlin, and of course, some of our colleagues here on the panel today that show that it does not work as well. Not certainly not in adults uh, at all. Uh, in pediatrics, I don't have any problem with equating the efficacy of indirect and direct. The kids have tremendous capacity to suck blood from, from anything you put there. But adults, uh, look, I refer you again to Peter Vashkozy. He quantified the degree of revascularization after direct and indirect. And there is no question, it's so much more in direct bypass. So as I said, I, I, I cannot answer you from personal experience because I don't use indirect at all. Um, maybe some other panelists can comment. I, I am, from my measurements of blood flow, clearly many of those cases are relatively urgent. And by the way, one of the other weaknesses of the cost study was that the average time to randomization was 72 days. I have tons and tons of patients. I don't feel comfortable waiting for 72 days to operate on them. Those are the so-called hot patients or urgent bypass patients. I, I am not comfortable putting an indirect bypass on somebody who I feel needs improved perfusion urgently or, 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 or you know, very soon. But, uh, you know, that, that's a summary of where I stand on this topic. I will ask you another question, uh, Jack, because the issue is under discussion. I am wondering, <clears throat> what do you think is the status in the world on indirect bypasses? Because, you know, I'm asking you because in my own department, <clears throat> I have not been doing this Moya Moya disease myself, but my colleague, my younger, my younger associate has been doing several, several, for several years, indirect bypasses all the time. And he comes and shows me often, not always, but he comes and shows me, see, see the blood flowing from extracranial, intracranial. And he shows me some fantastic uh, miracles when you have just put some muscle and the whole thing goes. My feeling is, of course, you know, direct will give you immediate supply and all those things, but direct has his own problem. Sometimes the vessels in Moya Moya are not so strong. Of course, Binzu can do anything and you can, of course, you have shown fantastic, but there are problems and everybody may not be very proficient in doing with this Moya Moya vessels, which are thin and which are not very well formed and you do the bypass and your bypass fails and you lose the opportunity. My Is hmm. direct plus indirect the answer or is only direct the answer? Well, most places do direct and indirect. Shubin and I think uh, Rokoa. I have I have not because I like to keep the surgery simple, and that's why I was actually quite curious to see how my data compares to others. Since I, I think I'm minimalistic in the sense not that I'm doing indirect, but I'm doing simply direct without putting the muscle, without getting some of this subdural stuff with aspirin. The, laying the muscle on the brain. That's why I don't do indirect, not because it's any more difficult to do combined. Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps we can learn from that comparison I made with the Fadi Sherbel data. 35% of his cases, he adds an EDAS along with his direct. And I, I hypothesize that that's why his long-term patency of the direct bypass is low, <clears throat> lower than mine. I, that, I, I can, it's just speculation. I don't know, but that would make sense to me. I don't know. I invite uh, Shu Ben or, or Rokoa to tell you what they think about the indirect portion of the surgery. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to apply the indirect bypass even in uh, adult Moya Moya patient. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the pediatric patient uh, has a very good uh, uh, efficacy of the indirect bypass. But the problem, if the patient 
Uh, regardless, uh, pediatric or adult patient have the uh, very severe ischemic impairment. The indirect bypasses must must be effective, but it takes time to have the uh, the sufficient revascularization for a muscular tissue to to the brain. So uh, we have uh, some uh, the bad cases in the pediatric case uh, after the uh, indirect only indirect bypass. Uh, because uh, the, uh, finally, the angiographical improvement was excellent, but the patient have the uh, something ischemic complication after surgery because of uh, the taking time of the uh, revascularization. So, the if the patient have the uh, very the severe ischemic condition before surgery, we should perform the, uh, the direct bypass. And simultaneously, we can uh, add the uh, indirect bypass. This is, a, this is my concept. And uh, for in an adult patient, the indirect bypass is not so effective. Very limited case have the uh, good uh, revascularization even through the, uh, even from the uh, muscular tissue tissues. So, uh, it's a uh, it's my concept. Professor Shubin, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, actually, it depends on the Suzuki stage. So for the early stage, like uh, uh, stage three or stage four, the MCA uh, network is still uh, integrate. So this kind of patient, if you do the direct bypass, it uh, the result is quite good. Uh, normally, it's good enough. For, uh, for the early stage moya moyas. So sometimes uh, the simple uh, STMCA bypass is enough. But for the late stage, like uh, stage four or uh, five or uh, six, uh, normally uh, the MCA network was uh, quite poor and the recipient artery was very small. Uh, this kind of uh, patient, uh, sometimes uh, it's already have some spontaneous stoma come from middle meninge artery, uh, which means this kind of uh, patient uh, suffered from the uh, uh, <clears throat> hypo, uh, hypooxemia uh, approach, both uh, STMCA combined with the EDMS. So, uh, for this kind of patient, uh, the EDMS is also very uh, effective because uh, the patient, uh, if the patient already gets some spontaneous stoma, it means this kind of patient have some uh, very good uh, potential to form the indirect bypass. Uh, Shu, uh, Shubin, how about the mm -hmm. concept of doing direct bypass on those stage four and five? and measuring the flow during surgery. If you like the numbers you have, don't add the EDAMs. And if you don't, then add it. What do you think of that physiological approach to the problem? Actually, I, I normally uh, uh, decide this uh, uh, operation strategy before surgery. Because you know, uh, in my department, uh, actually every uh, angiogram, preoperative angiogram, was uh, performed by ourselves. So we will analyze the MCA network. Yeah, actually, uh, the pressure gr uh, gradients is also very important because uh, sometimes some patient still keeps the physiological uh, pressure gradients, which which means uh, from M1 to M2 the pressure gradients is decreased. But uh, in some uh, special cases, uh, if the M1 is already occluded and the uh, moyama vessels were not so abundant, sometimes the <clears throat> pressure gradients is uh, reversed. So uh, M4 uh, pressure is larger than M3, then M2 is the uh, lowest pressure. So this kind of uh, patient, you can select the M3 or M2, even M2 as a recipient art, uh, as a recipient artery. So, the MCA network, the integrity of MCA network, is very important. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have Professor Hidehita Kimura who would like to ask his question. Yes, Professor Kimura. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Nice to see you here. Yeah, thank you for calling me. So, Hi, hello. Hello, Tanikawa, Dr. Tanikawa, nice to see you here. <laughs> hello, Zobin, nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you for your <laughs> nice presentations. So, unfortunately, I missed the anterior half of the Professor Marcos lecture, so I'm very sorry. So, I got uh, uh, Professor Wei Ni's lectures. So, I have one question, uh, just one question for Professor Wei Ni. So I have great interest about uh, especially hybrid decolonization technique and uh, multi-model inti integrated bypass techniques. So, so do you use the uh, ECOG, ECOG techniques interoperatively for the every STMC anastomosis surgery? This is my first question. Mm. And next uh, question in the okay. Oh, you can you can continue. Okay. Yeah. So uh, can, you, can we predict the post-operative seizures by using the ECOG, ECOG monitoring? So it is a, maybe a, it's a one of the uh, problems for the post-operative management for the patient to receive the STMC anastomosis. So in some patients, some kind, sometimes we have encountered a, a post-operative difficulty to control the seizures. So can we predict to the using the uh, ECOG interoperatively to predict the post-operative seizure? This is my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I will answer your question. Uh, for the first question, uh, we started to, to, to do the ECOG for every patient of the bypass patient in our group, uh, maybe two years ago, and we started to, to do it. Now, every patient, they will receive the, the ECOG uh, ECOG evaluation to, uh, intraoperatively. And uh, sometimes for these kinds of patients, we can find the epileptic wave uh, after the bypass. It, it will be uh, appeared simultaneously after we remove the uh, temporarily, uh, temporarily clip. So at that time, we will use the, the anti uh, epileptic drugs and during the operation, maybe we will use more uh, a lot a larger dose for like the uh, the anti uh, anti epileptic uh, medicine. So in this uh, style, we have not find any uh, epileptic seizures uh, after we use these kinds of uh, after we use these kinds of of therapy, oh. but uh, it definitely can uh, predict the epileptic seizures after the operation. So it's very important for us to use this uh, ECOG uh, to prevent the epileptic seizure. Maybe some of the epileptic wave is a, just a small local epileptic, mm -hmm. uh, epileptic seizures, and we can prevent it uh, and promote to the, to the very severe seizures after the operation. So it is useful, I think. I think. Um, so we currently we use uh, on every patient, right? Now. Oh, really? So Thank do you recommend us to use uh, this technique for us, for us all? Do you recommend? Mm, yes, I think uh, yes. I recommend. Yeah, some institute, yeah. some maybe some difficulty. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll try. Yes, another if chance. Thank you. Thank you, thank yeah. you so much. We can take one last question from my co-host Liu Bun Seng. You can thank ask thank one you, question. Jack. Yes. Okay, uh, Prof. Jack, uh, I, I I wanted to ask you regarding uh, you show us a study uh, where where the indirect bypass in, in a smaller caliber vessel that will be spontaneous occlusion. Uh, do you imply that or do you think that the uh, perfusion of the hypoperfused brain are a constant, means when they have an indirect bypass, most likely the smaller caliber vessel will be get occluded. Uh, Professor, thank you. So, sorry, I'm so I didn't, I don't think I understood the question. If the vessel, recipient vessel yeah. is smaller, is it more likely to get occluded, you mean? Yeah, if you have indirect bypass, I mean the, the indirect bypass does help to improve the perfusion. So the previously hypoperfusion brain 
uh, we need mm -hmm. some form of content uh, perfusion. So if they get something from indirect bypass, the smaller caliber bypass would not work if we occlude it. Is that what you are trying to tell us uh, yeah. in comparing the other study with yours? Uh, I'm speculating, I'm trying to differentiate the UIC data, why CFI was predictive of long-term patency with my data where CFI was not predictive. And I was puzzled. We probably use the same technique, Sherbel and I, we both use flow measurements. And I was wondering what else could differentiate, could explain the difference. And my only hypothesis is that he uses EDAS concomitantly with the direct bypass in 35% of the cases. I don't. And maybe having that indirect bypass grow over time explains why a very good direct bypass could slowly occlude over time. That, that's what my hypothesis is. I cannot prove it, but I, I don't have an alternative explanation. Right. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I think it's time we'll wind this up officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kert, I would like to thank both the speakers, Professor Jacques Murkos and Professor Nevi, and the chairs, Professor Lokuya Tanikawa and Professor Yoshida Kazumichi for coming here and taking out that time for teaching us and lending them support for the ACNS. Thank you very much. All the distinguished faculties who joined us, especially Professor Shubin, Professor Atul Goel, Professor Hideta Kumura, and everybody else. A special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Seng for coming here. That I would like to end this webinar. Thank you, everybody.